admit all students. Bom dia a todos, bem-vindos a mais, um, mais uma das nossas aulas, palestras né, do curso de Introdução à Engenharia de Som. E depois de uma temporada pela Europa, com palestrantes de diversos países da Europa, inclusive o último um indiano, que agora trabalha na Europa, a gente pula, atravessa o oceano, e chega na, nas Américas, os nossos próximos palestrantes. A gente começa hoje com o Felipe Otondo, que é professor na Universidade Austral do Chile, que fica em Valdívia. É, a gente acha que é sul, mas ainda é no meio do país. Eu acho que ele vai falar um pouquinho sobre isso. E, então, sem mais delongas, o Felipe vai contar um pouquinho da história dele e depois vai falar para a gente como a gente pode usar áudio espacial para aplicações interdisciplinares e criativas. Lippi, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. As we've been talking, uh, it would be great to have more uh, exchange between us in Latin America, and I hope this could be a start for it. Uh, so please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bruno. And thanks to all your colleagues from other universities. I'm delighted to, to be part of this series of talks and uh, especially with the, with the very interesting le lectures you have from other people from around the world. It's uh, such a great idea. We will try to, I will propose something like this to my colleagues. It's, it's a very, very interesting idea. So I'm gonna share the presentation which should be around 35, 40 minutes. And I think you should be seeing now the presentation. Is that okay? Yes, we are, perfect. Okay, great. So uh, my topic for today is talking about spatial sound as an interdisciplinary creative tool and uh, somehow this talk summarizes uh, some of the work I've been doing during the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years informally. And so somehow brings together the many interests that I've had throughout my, my life. And I think it's something that happens to a lot of people. Like you see some of the colleagues, we have a lot of creative activities and we have also our engineering activities. And I hope after this talk, I could show also that maybe the engineering and the arts are not that far away as we think they are, okay? So I will uh, give you a very brief introduction of my background. Basically, how did I come to work in this research uh, field? And then I will uh, tell you a little bit about my early research, and then I will basically focus on two case studies. I will start to talk first about some dance and theater collaborations, and then I will talk about my big current project that deals with wetland soundscapes. Okay, if you have some questions or you want to make any comments, you can always uh, make it on the chat, or you can also interrupt me at any moment. Right. So uh, I, am, I am originally from Santiago and I came to the south of Chile where I'm living now in Valdivia. It's around 900 kilometers south of Santiago. I came here to do uh, an acoustic engineering degree. It's a, it's a very unique course that was started by some German uh, scientists that came here in the late 60s and then it has been developing throughout the years. I did my degree, finished in 1998, then uh, uh, got a grant to go to Olbog University in the north of Denmark, where I did a, a, a master's in science program based uh, mostly on sound perception. I then worked for two EU projects at the, Technica, at the Danish Technical University in Copenhagen, uh, working with uh, 
the musical instruments, the activity of musical instruments. I'll talk about this in a moment. And then I decided to move a little bit away from the more tech. After my PhD, I got a job at a British university in Lancaster. I worked there for several years. And then in 2014, I could come back. I decided to come back to Chile. The Chilean uh, Research Council has some programs where you can basically go back. And somehow this little summary uh, will also uh, should come uh, uh, across in my presentation because this also shows a little bit how I've been trying to combine my engineering background with my later artistic background. Okay, that's kind of the framework for many of the things we will be talking uh, today. Right, so my early research activities were at the technical, the Danish Technical University. This is in the north of Copenhagen. And I was hired in a EU project called Mozart uh, as part of the room acoustics group there exploring the directivity of musical instruments. There hadn't been much research into this field. Uh, there was a famous book by Hugo Meyer, The Performance of Music. But there was not a lot of data of, of directivity of musical instruments. So we did quite a lot of recordings and measurements in an echoic uh, chambers, uh, thinking that all that data could be used later for acoustic modeling. So basically what we did was measure the directivity of the musical instruments. We have a trumpet here, this is the front, and we have the horizontal axis. So we basically plotted the directivity of the same instrument playing different notes. Like here we have a, a C4, and then we have the uh, uh, playing the, the A4 in the same octave. And as you can see, there's some changes in the directivity and the same happens with other instruments. So we were very interested in trying to see how does the directivity change for throughout a performance. This was a completely different approach. In the old days, people would measure the directive of musical instruments in a very sort of mechanical way, exciting the instruments. We really want to see how can we include the performer in, in this uh, measurement scenario and make the, make the, the, mostly the modeling as close as possible to a real performance situation. So then we use that data in the software. The software is called Odeon, still exists. It's one of the well-known uh, room acoustics software. We model that uh, directivity of the source and that had a, an impact in the way the sound is spread in the room. This is a, a concert hall in Sweden called Elmia. And what we basically did was model uh, different, the same uh, different notes in the room and see how the, the sound was basically spreading. And at the end, we did simulations like this, where you can see the sound source, and then you can see these little spheres that while they are uh, impinging, bouncing on different walls, they start changing colors, okay? This is a bit old fashioned now. This, is, uh, this was done 10, 15 years ago. So uh, I'm sure this has moved on. People have done much more sophisticated uh, directivity recordings and uh, I'm sure uh, the field has moved on dramatically. But on those days, it was uh, quite new to start to use uh, this uh, kind of recordings as measurements. So I started with that. And that gave me a lot of ideas uh, later when I started doing my PhD about how could we use sound in a performance context. So once I got into this whole uh, world of spatial audio, I started to understand better how our hearing system works, what are the limitations. And I found that there was a very conservative approach to the use of sound, especially in, in dance and theater. 
And as part of my PhD, we collaborated with the Northern Conservatoire of Contemporary Dance in Leeds, which is a big institution. And we got the chance to work with choreographers there. And very quickly, I realized, and this is probably one of the important <laughs> Uh, things I'm going to say in this talk, that once you come to collaborate with a, an artist or uh, someone from another field, the language, the methodology is extremely important. So I came there talking about timbre, you know, talking about intensity, the spectrum, you know, and people are very polite and they were, you know, they were interesting, but it was difficult to, to find some kind of middle way. To, to be able to communicate. But then I realized that space, the physical space is something that is shared across disciplines. And then I realized that if you talk with choreographers, they have a very unique and diverse uh, vocabulary towards the use of space, especially the, the use of space on stage that they do. Ideas of motion, ideas of balance, ideas of speed, ideas of positioning, and I thought, well, could we relate some of this uh, language of the spatial audio hmm, with the, the performance uh, uh, language related to space? And that's how we started collaborating. And uh, we started doing projects with uh, performers and singers. And this is one of the big projects of my PhD, where we did a music theater piece at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, which is one of the biggest experimental theater festivals in, in Europe. And we use sound sources carried by performers. So we thought, well, we will have the traditional sound system, but we'll also have performers moving, talking, and also carrying this uh, loudspeakers. And uh, with this work with choreographers, trying to explore a little bit the idea of the gesture, how can we relate the body and the sonic gesture. This interaction is extremely interesting, hmm? how, how the fixed system interacts with the moving sources. There's not a lot of research about moving sounds. Hmm? There's a composer, Henry Brandt, that did a lot of research in the 60s, but it's not an area that's been uh, developed very further uh, in music, at least. So uh, we did this piece, <laughs> and uh, uh, this is me, you know, I had to perform. This are the kind of things, you know, when you are on a low budget, you have to do. If you go to, to YouTube, you'll see the videos and you see me, my amazing performance, you know. Well, it was very embarrassing, but you know, these guys, these are professional dancers and this is a professional singer. So it was a big challenge, but it allowed me also to understand from the inside, the way a sound could be used on stage and also what are the limitations. These are ghetto blasters radios. This cost, I don't know, $50, $100. So we were working with very, very low budget, but they worked. They were very effective for, for what we wanted to do. That's also an important thing. Not necessarily many times the best artistic solution is the most expensive technical equipment, okay? And uh, uh, then I got a job in England and started working with choreographers more seriously and uh, started a project related to a body-worn sound vest for dance, which is the project that I brought when I came back to Chile. So we tried to uh, develop further the idea of the, the ghetto blasters, but now developing an original sound system that could be carried out by the performer. It would be smaller and it would allow also the performer to move freely. I work with this choreographer and this dancer, and we were basically trying to see how we could relate the uh, sound design in a piece with the choreographer. Very interested in how would be the feedback from the performer, how would how does it feel? Does it limit uh, the performer in terms of movement? Is it too heavy? Is it too loud? Can it be dangerous for the performer? And also we were very interested in getting feedback from audiences. Hmm? How would they react to a moving performer that is not a musician, it's not a dancer, it's something somewhere in between. Hmm? Uh, we took the, the sound system later to the Aranecoic chamber and 
basically we made some measurements. I'll give a few details, technical details of the system. This is a wireless standalone application. As you can see, there's uh, two loudspeakers, small on the arms and one larger loudspeaker on the torso. This is all wired. This is standalone uh, and wireless. We have a pack of batteries in the back and we have a Bluetooth transmitter that allows us to connect to a, a laptop. This is a two channel system. That means that one channel goes to the arms and the second channel goes to the uh, torso speaker. As you can see, the speakers in the torso is larger than the ones in the, in the arms, which uh, implies that they have very different frequency response. And as I said, we had a Bluetooth system. I will show you a video with it, uh, with uh, measuring this, uh, this vest in the anechoic chamber. Uh, and you will see uh, the different intensities of sound related to colors, but also try to listen because I think one can hear also the fluctuations, especially in the high frequencies. Okay, I think you get the idea. And we hear a lot of uh, filtering, a lot of uh, face cancellations, and we hear a lot of variations, but we can get a feeling, especially how the, the sound of the system is, is, is changing dramatically. And the loudspeakers are very, have a very strong directivity, especially the ones in the arms. So, so the, the signal that you were playing was always a white white noise. Yes, in this mm -hmm. case, it was white noise, which was just for the purpose of of the of the tests. Hmm? This is something. Uh, this is an interesting uh, issue because <clears throat> due to the size of the speakers, the the kind of sound material one can play is very limited. Hmm? So, as a composer, I started with a lot of designing a very complex sound design, but very quickly I realized that you have, some, have to somehow tune to the, to the system. But for measurements, we, we use uh, white noise. So we, we realized that this is a powerful creative tool. We start, uh, there's a new sort of concept of musician, performer, dancer, this, this blend of, of, of was very interesting. And I think also was something very attractive to the audience. Uh, the interaction with the audience changed also because we could more uh, we didn't have to use the more traditional configuration we could uh, put seats around the performer and that had a, a, an impact and there are some technical limitations like any engineering project as i said to bruno the tambra is is not great the size of the cab of the enclosures has a lot to do with the frequency response, as you know. And these are tiny, tiny speakers. So uh, we cannot expect a very sophisticated frequency response. So Tambra is an issue. Somehow you have to adapt to the system and find the sounds that really work. Hmm? You couldn't get much better results, but then you have to make the speakers bigger. So there was always this constraint in terms of the quality of the sound and then the size of the of the loudspeakers, and they would become uh, well more, more cumbersome for the performer and also aesthetically it would not be uh, great. That's the issue of power. You have batteries in the back and they will have a certain duration, but they are also, you can have more batteries, but they are more heavy. Again, you have to balance this trade-off. And finally, the Bluetooth communication system is 
reliable, but it, when the when the room is larger and the distance from the computer to the performer is larger, you could have some problems. Hmm? So that was more or less the 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 project and the outcome we have. And then I'm going to talk about the second case study, which is a larger project which I've been developing this uh, last four or five years that has to do with soundscape, soundscape research, and mostly has to do with, uh, with what has happened in the world in the last 10, 20 years, which due to increasing noise pollution, we've become a lot more aware of uh, our sonic environment. I guess it's been something that we've all experienced in the last years with COVID, the background noise in our cities has gone down, the traffic has gone down, and somehow we've had the chance to reconnect to our acoustic environment in a different way. Hmm? Soundscape research is an interdisciplinary research topic, and probably uh, the person that uh, conceived this as an interdisciplinary field was Murray Schaeffer, who still lives, he's in his 80s. He was, uh, he's a Canadian, uh, composer and researcher, and he was the first one that understood that uh, the issue of noise and the issue of the sound that surrounds us uh, was something that uh, has to be, had to be conceived as an interdisciplinary field. And he wrote, wrote this wonderful book, The Tuning of the World, which I believe is in Portuguese. There's a Portuguese version. Actually, there was no Spanish version until a couple of years ago. So I would definitely recommend you to look at the book. It's called The Tuning of the World. I'm not sure what's the name in Portuguese, but you can find it. And it's a, it's a book that is very inspiring. Some things are a little bit dated, but th some things are extremely relevant to uh, the problems we have today. One of the interesting things that came out of this uh, uh, recent research in soundscape is a new ISO uh, three-part, the ISO 12913. Probably the most interesting part is part two, where uh, there are recommendations for the development of field recordings in various formats, binaural and ambisonics. And that's something I'm going to talk a little bit now. Mm -hmm. So this is a graph that shows what I was telling you, the number of publications related to the topic of soundscape in recent years. And as you can see, it has increased considerably. The reason for this is mostly because uh, now biologists are working with sound. We have uh, architects working with sound, uh, urban uh, planning designers working with sound. We have, of course, musicians, and we have uh, people doing video games. So uh, a lot of people are working with, with field recordings mostly. And this is also due to the fact that uh, recording equipment has, has become cheaper and cheaper. Mm -hmm. So nowadays to do semi-professional recordings is not very expensive, which is a very, a very good thing. So uh, very much inspired by Mr. Sheffer, uh, we thought we would start uh, exploring some of the local soundscapes. Mm -hmm and wetlands in Valdivia. In 1960, there was a big earthquake. They say the biggest in history. Chilean people, I guess in Brazil is the same. They say it was the biggest in history, you know, in the world and the, the, sky, the scale reached 9.7, I don't know what. But it was very dramatic in 1960. And that created, uh, it made parts of the city, basically the land went down and it created these spaces wetlands. As you can see, this is Valdivia, the city center. We have this river, Calle Calle, that crosses the city. And we have various wetlands, as you can see, with numbers around the city. These are, uh, there are problems related with wetlands because most citizens don't really understand the use. They're not parks. They're not places really people can, you know, get close to. And uh, there's a lot of uh, illegal uh, dumping of, of garbage in these places. There's also uh, 
unregulated construction sites that are taking use of some of the wetlands. So it's a political issue. And we thought, could we maybe approach this issue from a slightly different uh, angle? And we thought, what about if we start doing long recordings in wetlands and see what's happening there? Could you hear what's going on there? Is there activities? Is there what's really happening? And uh, we got with my team making a lot of different field recordings. We use a special equipment that's designed to for different kinds of weathers, very robust equipment. We built cages, we put uh, loud uh, microphones up uh, trees, and we use also uh, slightly more sophisticated recording equipment that I will explain in a moment. We have ambisonics microphones, uh, dummy heads that would provide us binaural recordings. So we use different approaches for obtaining field recordings. Hmm? Some recordings, very long recordings like this ones, we program these little machines and we could basically record five minutes every hour of every hour during a whole year. Those recordings are available if any of you are interested. We have this database in Google Drive that anyone can access these recordings. They are free. So I'll show you a video that explains a little bit the scope and you get also a feeling of the landscape and the places where we carried out these field recordings. Mi área de trabajo consiste en el registro sonoro como material base para la creación de los timelapse. Los registros se están realizando en tres humedales. Estamos trabajando en el humedal Parque Urbano El Bosque, en el humedal Angachilla y en el humedal Miraflores. Ese registro lo estamos haciendo en varios formatos. Uno que tiene que ver con, con la normativa ISO de paisaje sonoro y otro que estamos usando un sistema de monitoreo de, de largo tiempo que estamos registrando en este momento 365 días. Esas estaciones están haciendo un registro de, de sonido eh, en un formato que toman muestras de 5 minutos cada hora. O sea, tenemos 24 muestras en un día de 5 minutos. Y además este, están haciendo un registro de una hora en el amanecer y una hora en el atardecer para hacer análisis de esa información en, buscando especies de pájaros que pueden aparecer en esos horarios. El, este registro va a permitir que las próximas generaciones puedan escuchar lo que pasaba aquí en, en una época del año. Es una fotografía de lo que está pasando hoy en términos sonoros. Y además creo que otro eh, aporte importante tiene que ver con poder llevar estos sonidos a, a personas que, que no tienen la posibilidad de estar aquí, ya sea porque viven fuera, porque no se dan el trabajo de venir o porque eh, en términos físicos o limitaciones de algún tipo eh, de ese tipo no le permiten estar acá. Entonces eso también para mí es importante que funcione como un aporte, o sea poder llevar este ambiente sonoro a otros lugares. Okay. All right, so you got a feeling of, of the places where we made the recordings, the different systems, and my colleague, uh, Rodrigo, uh, who was the one that carried out most of the recording during uh, that year. Hmm? What I want to show you now is give you a glimpse of uh, different types of recordings and how they can be perceived. Hmm? I will show you an example of some of these recordings carried out in a wetland uh, in the afternoon, where we will hear uh, recordings carried out in uh, mono with one channel using uh, an omnidirectional microphone. 
we will have a stereo recording with two omnidirectional microphones in a space pair uh, technique. And finally, we'll hear the binaural Newman recording. What you will hear is basically one recording, then you'll hear the other one after a gap, there's a gap and the other one. These are multi-channel recordings that were carried out simultaneously. This is very important. So we didn't, we recorded everything at the same time. You will hear exactly the same, but with three different uh, recording techniques. I cannot, we, uh, I cannot play through Zoom, but I will include there on the chat, you can see the link on SoundCloud. So if you have your headphones uh, close to you, if you could just grab them, and uh, we're just gonna give a few, like a minute and a half for people to listen. And uh, I don't know, Bruno, should we say like one, two, three? You want to run this? Okay. So uh, let's listen to the file. Uh, we're doing it this way. So you can, of course, appreciate the stereo and the binaural recording because uh, Zoom will play it in mono. Hmm? So we'll give now a minute and a half and set your headphones and we will listen to the, the link on SoundCloud. Okay, so we'll make a little break, a minute and a half. Please listen to the recording now. Okay, so that should be finishing by now. Okay, so what you heard uh, was, as I said, three samples of a multi-channel recording. You heard the mono recording carried out with one microphone, an omnidirectional microphone. Then you hear, heard the stereo recording and then the binaural recording. You should have heard some frogs at a certain distance of 50, 100 meters, some frogs very close to the microphones, and at the end, some distant barking dogs that were more on one side. And uh, it's interesting, and um, you can listen to the recordings again, and I will invite you to do so and focus on the timbre, see how the timbre changes from one version to another one, how the intensity of the sound sources changes, the position of the sound sources, especially comparing the stereo recording with the manual recording, and also the sense of perspective, the depth, how can we hear the different sort of uh, uh, elements, either closer or further away. So there's quite a lot we can do with, uh, in this case, simple two-channel recordings. And that's also what we what we try to do with the, with the project. So uh, we were very interested in the spatial side, but we were also very interested in exploring ways of presenting this, because it was all very nice to say, look, there's a lot going on in a in a wetland. You know, if you make this very long recordings, you will identify all sort of different bird species and, and different types of mammals. But it still was very difficult to get to people and so that they appreciate the the value of the of the soundscape. So we thought if we uh, maybe we should try to make some kind of sonic time lapse. 
at, very much inspired by visual time lapse. We know what's uh, time lapse. We, we can do that with our phones, also with a camera. Basically, we take pictures, which we over we take pictures over time during a particular period of time, and then we overlap them. Hmm? Because of the way the eye works, we suddenly get this feeling of, of motion and the feeling that somehow time would go very, very quickly. Hmm? The ear works in a slightly different way. We cannot capture like uh, an image. Uh, we have to capture in this case, what we did was taking portions of, of sounds. Hmm? And uh, basically what we did was take this very long uh, field recording. We have here a spectrogram. We have frequency on the audible range from 20 to 20 kilohertz. And we have 24 hours. These are the events happening in a wetland. Frogs, you know, we have uh, also noise, background noise. We have birds. We have rain, for example, here. And then if we take samples from every hour, we would reconstruct this uh, audio file of four minutes in this case. So somehow create this short time capsule that takes the more salient, important acoustic uh, events to build this. So we took this approach, uh, spatial, spatial temporal, as we call it. And uh, that's how we created the, the I'm sorry, I don't know why what happens with the mouse. We took this approach and we and we created this time lapse. Mm -hmm. This is another example. As you can see, we in this case get 24 hour. We do the original recording, we do the sampling, and we create this montage, which is this one. It's a very short, and then we create a file. Mm -hmm. So we we thought, how could we use this in a more creative kind of context? Mm -hmm. And we work with the museums here in Valdivia in connection with mapping. So this is a museum in the center of Valdivia and they have a very sophisticated mapping uh, system where they project uh, visual images on the walls and also on the ceiling and also on the floor. And we design an audiovisual installation. We basically place speakers in different parts, trying to relate somehow some of the visuals with the, with the sounds. Hmm? Somehow we expected to go from the wetland with this kind of recordings, create a sound design in the lab using a different uh, multi-channel uh, sound system, and then uh, recreate that sound design in the room. For that purpose, we use uh, the same time-lapse uh, processing, we did that uh, live. So we had a computer that was actually doing this time-lapse process and doing the, the specialization, basically using a, a database of recordings, doing the time-lapse, taking sampling, creating this short uh, audio time-lapse montage, doing some processing to basically specialize the sound in one room and another one. So the time loss was changing, something was longer, we're taking samples from one day from another, and that's how we, we basically implemented that. Somehow we want to bring the spatial characteristics, the sonic environment from the wetland, in this case, to the museum. Some final conclusions. Well, the physical space as we've seen is a very simple but profound shared attribute of creative disciplines such as dance and music. Spatial sound can be used as an effective interdisciplinary creative tool, as we've seen, is something shared by the different disciplines. All disciplines have a language that relates to space. Spatial sound in this case involves aesthetic, perceptual, and also technical issues that need to be taken into account. And finally, uh, by careful listening, we can understand better and therefore preserve our unique sonic environment. And that was more or less the, the scope of, the, of our Sound Labs project. I will leave you with a, with a video that uh, we carried out with my great colleague, my Brazilian colleague, Andre Mestre, and you will see him presenting the project. This is an installation we've done for a, uh, an international competition, Ars Electronica. And uh, what you will see here is a slightly different take 
taking some of these recordings and creating a sonic sculpture where things are, are presented in a particular way. So I'll leave you with that video just to finish our presentation. The Soundlabs project started with this strange question. What would it be like to stand in these wetlands as they disappear and listen to them continuously for every hour of every day? When something like an ecosystem disappears, there are devastating material costs, we have loss of biodiversity, loss of material resources, and loss of its life-sustaining functions. There are as well less tangible consequences. We also lose how those things existed in sounds and how they participated in our sonosphere. Sound Labs is a project that brings together sound artists, acoustic engineers, biologists and computer scientists with the aim of studying, preserving and sharing wetland soundscapes. Across the world, wetlands are a key source of biodiversity they play a significant role in the supply of fresh water and the survival of different species of plants and animals. Over the past decades, citizens and community-based organizations have become increasingly concerned about the environmental impact of human intervention over these natural habitats. Soundlabs adds an acoustic dimension to existing efforts to raise awareness towards wetland conservation. The project does so by carrying out large-scale documentation in an unprecedented scale, capturing the soundscape of various urban wetlands surrounding the city of Valdivia, Chile. This documentation became the basis of Sound Labs, an application capable of identifying the most significant acoustic events in a long recording, producing a condensed listening experience of wetland soundscapes. So, what would it be like to stand in the middle of a wetland and to listen to everything in it? Um, well, a cap de cell is one answer to that. The work is an installation made of kinetic sculptures inside an immersive sound lapse, wherein the whole days and even the changing of seasons can be heard within the hour. It brings together both the material aesthetics of the Valdivian wetlands and its intangible dimension. It sounds, it's haunting vastness, reflecting the morning and the evening light. The whole installation is animated by vibrations, traversed by the soundscape that surrounds it. Hopefully our work uh, affords its viewers a less human perspective on the natural world and, and more reasons to preserve it. Okay, so this is the website of the project. You can go in there and see the videos, download the files, see some 3D videos as well. And uh, that's it. That's Obrigado. Great. Gente, que agradece. Muito obrigado pela apresentação. Thank you very much. Guys, uh, yeah, really, there is a lot of engineering behind this. Uh, artistic implementations, right? You didn't dive into that, but I'm pretty sure there was some, some lines of codes that have been written there. <laughs> Could you comment on that? How, 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 how was the, the back office, the programming, and how was that done? 
Yes, well, to be honest, I didn't do much of it. Uh, we have a team, and as you can see, we have some master student. This is a uh, uh, Diego Espejo, one of our master students. So uh, we have uh, we had different teams, and one of the teams was uh, is still working on, <clears throat> excuse me, on the 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 algorithm to especially incorporate now machine learning techniques. So they've worked very hard. They're on our signal processing sort of group within uh, the acoustics department. And we work in connection with people from the computer science department. And uh, yes, there were some students and two colleagues, one from acoustics and one from, compu from the computers, uh, computer science department. So yes, there was a lot of programming in the first year, a lot of trial and error, also because <clears throat> we're talking about long audio files that made things, of course, a bit more complicated. They always used to work with very short samples. Now they had to use these huge files of 24 hours. So yeah, there was a lot of fun, a lot of trial and error, frustration. Well, like the life of engineers, as you know, <laughs> that's what we <laughs> do. The and the time lapse, the, the idea was to find the main or the most salient, if that was the word you said, the, the most Im important parts of the of this large sound, just cut them and paste them together, or, or was there more to it? Yes, and we're going to go back a bit. So originally, we just did uh, this uh, crudely by taking samples. For example, every 30 seconds, we would just take a sample. Hmm? That mm -hmm. was the, or the, the original idea, and that's where we started. But uh, the current uh, algorithm, what we're trying to do is that this, uh, through machine learning techniques, we can analyze the, the file and sort of label the main acoustic sort of elements so that the sampling process will be done uh, tailored to the specific field recording. Mm -hmm. So yes, it started like that, completely arbitrary sampling. And now we are trying to do this sampling process uh, much more detailed and tailored to, to the specific recordings using machine learning techniques. My colleagues are, are the experts in, in that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. I guess Eric has a question. Yes, thank you, Bruno, and uh, thank you, Felipe, as well, for the presentation. It's so nice to see uh, something that is not only very useful, but also very beautiful as well. Uh, to listen to it and to see it was very pleasant. Uh, so thanks for that. I was uh, wondering, um, how do you actually collect uh, the sound files? Is it something that you have to access, uh, to access the, the main recording uh, device from time to time and download it and how hard it is uh, to get there outside and so on? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, well, this was also trial and error because I think I said the, the you know, uh, the recording equipment is cheap now, but of course, that you cannot use that kind of recording equipment here. We used in the first years, you know, it took me four or five years to raise the funding to, to run this project properly. So we use basically uh, the way we constructed the, most of the, the work was using these recordings. It's called Wildlife uh, Acoustic SM4, it's called Birdsong. And it's built by an American company and it has everything built in. And we program it so that it would be sampling five minutes every hour. You put in a SD card there, you put some batteries, and this will last for three or four months. And it's uh, waterproof, it will, it will run quite well. They're not very good with the wind. That was something we discovered lately at, afterwards that, you know, this microphones well, we could have done some kind of other arrangements probably to deal with the wind, but they are very reliable. You can synchronize them with a ethernet and a GPS uh, little device. So we, we did that and you can put them with a little lock, you know, up a tree and they're very safe as well. So that's what we did. We went there every two or three months and changed the SD cards and, and that's how we, we managed. 
Uh, before we then ask, uh, there, there is also a question in YouTube that goes in that the same direction that Gabriel is asking, uh, what sample rate did you use for the recordings? Was it the same uh, standard 44K or did you go up in frequency? He's asking that because uh, when he uses uh, sound, sound effects of boom library, he sees that uh, he uses 90, 96 kilohertz uh, sampling rate. Right, yeah, it's an interesting question. These devices, they, again, this is a trade-off, the engineering trade-off, okay? You want to record more hours, you can not record in such a high quality. Hmm? Uh -huh. These devices are built to, to record birds, you know, that's that's why they call birds. So you can go cannot go up more than 16 bit and 44.1 kilohertz. That was the, the, the sample rate that we use on the quantization. Hmm? If you use other devices like this, we did uh, use 24 bit 48 kilohertz for these recordings. But for the long, long recordings, we, we use uh, 16 bit 44.1 and stereo. Hmm? But um, I believe the new versions probably have a higher frequency range. To be honest, and this is something we have discussed with my colleagues, I'm not sure if you're making field recordings, if it's so important, you know, to have a, a, an extremely high, you know, sampling frequency or use really high tech recordings. Many times there will be a lot of background noise. So you have to think also carefully about that, really. What's the trade of to make recordings, you know, that will definitely use a lot more space in the in the little cards. If you if you're recording outdoors where maybe there's background noise, there's all sort of fluctuations. Hmm? But that was the sampling rate we use. 16-bit, uh, 44.1 kilohertz. But that's where the engineering comes, right? If, the, if there's background noise, you don't need that that uh, that a high bit depth. Uh, William, you wanted to ask something? Yeah, no, I, I think it's um, uh, about this 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 uh, this slide. I was wondering to ask about rain. And this second picture, I was wondering if that's to, to protect the device from birds or animals to interact, let's say. Yeah, I think my colleagues wanted to show off a little bit, you know, smallest that would have like some wild animals that could, you know. I think it, it the thing is when there's the frog mating season where you get a lot of frogs, if you put them close to the ground like this, the frogs will get everywhere. And that's why we designed this and we made some tests up the up the, with, on our tree. And basically we were using this, as you can see, you can still see the shades there. And it was basically, basically in order to make it more convenient to put different uh, arrays on our on a little cage, but we didn't use this much. It's very complicated, you know, you have to bring up the, the cage, you need to open it. So we only carry out a few little tests with this, but it could be handy when you have, especially when you have microphones on the surface and you're gonna leave them for long periods of time. Yeah. And for the, the monitoring, bird monitoring system, is it uh, work? okay with rain because you, you showed us before some spectrogram of rain yes that's a very good point i mean they don't hmm? <laughs> you... <laughs> i'm trying to get now to the to the spectrogram of the just a second they are i think they are electric microphones and they what happens is that uh, you get this hmm? You know, it will rain a little bit, and then the the little fluffy thing will start, you know, getting wetter and wetter, and there comes a point where you get a saturation like this. Hmm? I see. So it's an issue, <clears throat> and I know a lot of field recorders that they they struggle with this. It rain and wind are very complicated because you know if you put something, it will start hitting, and then you will start recording that. So it's. You have to be very creative, and I don't think we managed to come with a with a solution uh, for that. Still, the the recordings are okay, but it will get very wet. It will act as a filter. It will saturate a bit the microphones, and they, I guess, they dry up, and then they continue working fine. 
Mm? Yeah, okay. But it is a problem. Wind and rain are an issue, definitely. Yeah, congrats. It's, it's quite a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> but wind and rain, it's it's part of the environment. You have to <laughs> have to record with them, right? Uh, Leandro is also asking, he he says that he's curious about uh, your mic, the microphones techniques you used. If you put two uh, DPA 4060 in a structure similar to the dummy head, can you achieve results similar to the binary recording? With the with the, with the DPAs, the 4060? Yeah, if you just place two microphones in a structure similar to the dummy head. Could be, yes. Uh, I haven't tried it. You mean like uh, separated and maybe, you know, you're making some little holes in a, in a sphere or something like that? Well, the uh, question comes from YouTube. Not sure what he's thinking okay. of, but there, there, are, think... uh, there are options like that, right? Yes. I mean, you can try a, a DPA 4060 are very good microphones. They are kind of standard for, for, for cinema and others. What you will get if you use uh, some kind of physical uh, sphere or something, you will get more separation. Hmm? The, the space technique, of course, gives you a nice space and it doesn't give you such a positioning uh, sort of uh, quality like the, like the coincident pair, for example. Hmm? So I think it's a trade-off, and you have to you have to try it out. I think you can increase the separation <clears throat> in the recording if you if you do something like that. But the result will be very different because in this case the microphones are inside the the pinna, you know, and I think there are microphones that have been also designed in order to work as a, as a complex. So you can get recordings that will be a bit more binaural, but I think still the difference will be. Big, especially because the microphones are inside the ear canal here, and uh, you will probably have to put them outside of this uh, sphere or something. Hmm? Yeah, there are some uh, some uh, systems where you have the two microphones placed in the position of the ears, and then you have just a disc, a hard yes. surface disc in between that gives you a first approximation. Yeah. And you could, of course, place them in inside a sphere which would be, or not inside, but have a sphere in place then uh, on the surface of the sphere that would give you a, a second approximation and you could always improve on the... Yes. Um, and, and maybe it's a good solution if you're going to play uh, the recordings through loudspeakers, you know, so that could also be some kind of middle way between the binaural and the stereo and probably you could play them with loudspeakers and they will work probably better than a binaural recording. So it could be practical in that sense. Hmm? Cool. Uh, anybody else, any questions? Uh, I have a question, Bruno. Um, Felipe, it was great your talk. It was great to see how you, you, get, to, you get people from different areas together, uh, people from arts and biology uh, architecture that, so that's great but I, I have a question you just mentioned about uh, about financial support you you needed four or five years to get support for this project and and I am curious to know where you get support financial support from is, is that from the government or companies yeah, well, in Chile, we mostly get it from the state, unfortunately. There's very little research done by, yeah. by companies. So I had to apply for the big, uh, well, research council grants that are very competitive. It took me several years, and that's how we got to, to pay for the, for the project. So it's a Chilean uh, research council. Conicet, and when, right? Sorry? Conicet. Yes, now it's called ANID. As they change the name. They, governments okay. like to do that. They, it's called Asociación Nacional de Investigación y Desarrollo. And then the, the program within that structure that finances is FONDESIT, which is uh, these are regular uh, calls that you get every year to apply for, for projects. It could be two to four year projects. Very competitive. You get like 
20, 30 percent of applications that are financed. Mm -hmm. So yes, I tried several years, and on the third uh, <laughs> attempt, I got the the grant, mm -hmm. and I'm planning to apply again this year. So if any of you are going to assess my application, I <laughs> I salute you. <laughs> Uh, Maris, no, that's they, just a joke. <laughs> uh, I I knew about Conisit because we I submitted together with Sebastian Fingerhut that you know we oh, submitted yeah. one proposal. Uh, it was a joint proposal between Fapesp and Conisit, which is now uh, right. a need. Uh, so they they have there are some uh, uh, joint uh, openings between Brazil and Chile. You might all right. Wanna. I'll, I'll tell Andre, my colleague, because he's, he's very interested in, in that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how it's in this, these years now, but we, we tried that a couple of years ago. Unfortunately, we, we weren't selected. As, as Philip say, it was, it was very competitive, but, but we applied for it. So you can always keep an eye open for, for these opportunities. Okay, uh, any other questions uh, regarding the subject? Uh, it was, uh, I really enjoyed uh, to have- a... I, I have one Go very ahead. practical question. Uh, maybe you have this photo with the, the dummy head in the middle of the forest. And I, I am wondering uh, how careful or how afraid it is to take such a expensive equipment into the forest, considering that you can have rain and unpredictable yeah. weather and stuff like this. Yeah, I think it's it's not it's not recommendable. I think it's uh, we only did this for a couple of hours in the afternoon, but uh, I think it's yes, this equipment is clearly not built for for this. Hmm? So I would say people have to be very careful. Hmm? I'm not sure if my colleagues knew I was going to do this. They would have, <laughs> I could have borrowed the, the dummy head, but at least for 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 what we did in this case was okay. But we could never do this very long recordings with equipment like this. It would just be too too damp and humid. It will destroy the the microphones, I guess. So it's tricky. There's another line of research to develop. Uh special equipment, uh, binary recording equipment for extreme weather situations. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> okay. We can write a proposal on that. And that's recording, true. Recording on the Amazon. That's true. Uh, <laughs> if we yeah. still have Amazon in a couple of years. We're trying to, to build a, a, a simple low cost dummy head uh, in Santa Maria. So. Yeah. Well, we still uh, we have some some stuff going on slowly. <laughs> right. And what's your feeling? I mean, you can probably you can do a, a reasonable dummy head with a with a, a bit of with not a high investment, do you? Yeah, yeah. We can. Uh, the idea is to build um, based on um, like not DPA's expensive fancy microphones, but cheaper microphones and a kind of uh, head and uh, part of the torso model and a Raspberry Pi so you can spend much less and still get some interesting results so we have right. the idea we, we started something <laughs> all right good well, luck with that need to, you need to, to change your microphones to waterproof microphones and I guess that's it yeah, some stuff we have to, to look into that in direction, but uh, still it, it works for, for example, if you, if you want to go to fairs or uh, outside the university, it's, it's kind of difficult because you have to do some paperwork to get the, the fancy expensive instrumentation. So it's just for to show the techniques it's, it's working nowadays, but uh, it's quite simple. Uh, we are not addressing uh, rain and wind uh, for now. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, some ideas, just to share some ideas.
Oh, great. It will be very interesting to see what you guys get out of that. Good, good. Guys, we are already past the hour. Okay. Um, you know, Philippe is uh, it's one hour behind, so now it's time for lunch for him. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Philippe, once again, thank you very much for uh, showing our work to us. And we're very pleased that you accept this invitation. Let's give a hand of applause for the presentation. <laughs> and don't be a stranger. Hope we can collaborate in the, in the future. Definitely. Very nice to meet you guys and congratulations for this great idea. It's such an amazing idea of bringing together university. I think I'm going to propose it also. Maybe we can do something similar here. Okay. Okay. Bye. Thank bye. you very much. Perfect. Bye bye. Gracias. Ciao, ciao. Ciao. Hey, ciao.